Dillahunty, debater extraordinaire, Texan of awesome boots, and um, my friend and uh, a damn good guy. You need to check out his show if you haven't already. It will teach you stuff you didn't even know you needed to learn. Matt, thank you, and uh, yeah. I'm just if hugging everyone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Matt Dillahunty. There's a lot to get to. How's everybody doing? You guys enjoying something? This is where you find out who likes you because uh, you actually came back from lunch to hear something. So uh, thanks much. So the, the theme of the conference is Think Again. And uh, I think we should do that all the time about absolutely everything. And I've said before that I am a friend to the religious by being an enemy to religion. And I'm also a friend to the atheist people that I love and come and speak to. Uh, by telling them things that some of them don't necessarily want to hear. And last year at the American Atheist Convention, I was uh, talking about how atheist groups aren't always skeptical enough, both to suit me and I think in general, and that it's, a, it's an issue. And so I'm very happy that I was invited back this year uh, to tell you all off again. <laughs> but um, today I want to talk about debates. And I've done a lot of them. Um, I don't know how many people have seen some of them, but uh, I enjoy it. The TV show, by the way, The Atheist Experience is a live call-in show. I guess I should start my clock. Now, those are the minutes of yours I'm going to eat up, Chris. Um, so it's a live call-in show, and basically it is, let's have a debate. Let's have a discussion. I've learned a lot of lessons over that. I talked a little bit about it in the workshop the other day that we did at the beginning of the conference. And also, uh, Seth Arnon and I are on this Unholy Trinity tour, and I tell some stories for some of the debates. I might get to one of those today. Um, by the way, I need to do this, and I'll apologize, uh, and just be honest. Raise your hand if you know who Saiten Bruggenkate is. 17, 18, thank you. Because he thinks you all know who he is. Or at least Eric is. So should we be debating? Does it work? And how important is it? And I've heard some opinions expressed, including from this podium this weekend, uh, that kind of poo-poo debates. And that's okay, because you're entitled to your opinion, and we are all entitled to be spectacularly wrong. And they are. <laughs> First thing to know about debates is that I don't tend to view it as winning or losing. I recognize that people do, and I recognize that this is easy to do, and you can look at the Ken Ham, Bill Nye debate, and pretty much everybody's going to say, yeah, Bill won. Uh, but I don't tend to look at it as winning or losing because I'm not there trying to change the mind of my opponent. I am there to present information and get it out to an audience because that's where the, the biggest value is. There are very few people who are going to change their mind over the course of a single debate, although it has happened. And when you're doing it for the audience instead of your opponent, and instead of for yourself, you're going to do a better job. Now, I don't, first of all, I don't presume that everybody out here is going to be running out to start doing formal public debates, time debates, and all these other things with formats and stuff. Most of you are going to be engaged in the informal debates, talking to the people you love about why they're wrong. You can get a lot out of the big public debates that others are doing. Debates are about getting information out to both theists and atheists. You get information out to the theists, that allow them to challenge their beliefs, and you get out information to atheists so that they can help develop better arguments as we continue to move forward. It's about making sure that theists get to hear about atheists from atheists instead of from the pulpit, which has been the problem for a long, long time. Their perception of who atheists are is dictated by whichever authority they happen to accept that stands in front of them and says what atheists are. We need to be the authority on what atheists are. And they need to get that into their heads really quickly. I don't want them to ever be able to say they've never met an atheist. I don't want them to ever be able to say they've never met an atheist who couldn't defend their position. I don't want them to ever be able to say they haven't met a nice atheist, no matter how much of an asshole they may think I am from time to time. Debates, why would you do these big formal public debates? It's a little bit about kind of rising above the polemics, which I think have their place. Rising above the ridicule, which I'm absolutely positive has its place, and anybody who's seen my show will attest to that. Above the snark, 
If you think about it, though, a book like The God Delusion or David Fitzgerald's Nail, those are debates. The key to doing this is to make sure that you know your opponent's position as well or better than they do. And every time we have a book come out that becomes an atheist bestseller, it is a little miniature debate. Many times they'll be presenting the arguments of the opposition and rebutting them. You're only getting the information from one side, but considering that the other side has had many millennia of privilege and advantage about getting their information out, I'm not going to discount anybody for actually putting out a book that's one-sided. The other question that comes up quite often is who should be debating? Should Bill Nye have agreed to debate Ken Ham? I'm not going to do a show of hands because we're going to need a fist fight breaking out in the middle of my talk, but I don't tend to like, like it when scientists debate creationists and people who are advocating for anti-science because it falsely elevates the anti-science, the creationist position, and it wastes the time of the scientists. The Discovery Institute wedge document includes a multi-tiered plan, which one of them is to go out and actually do their peer-reviewed research to demonstrate that their position is true. And even though this has been around for many, many years, they still haven't done it. And the, the response that they should be getting from us is, we will take you serious and we will allow you know, and encourage scientists to actually debate you when you've done your damn homework that you said you were going to do and when you've made some attempt to demonstrate that your position is scientific. But as long as you're just going to be the person who grabs poo and throws it and rubs it all over science, why would any scientist want to come debate you? But I'm fine with science enthusiasts debating creationists. For example, let's, let's get R and Raw out there to debate them left and right. Because the lies that these creationists are telling have to be combated. You have to get in, you have to go into that territory and actually engage. One of the reasons that I think we should do it is because we can explain why they are wrong. And in other cases where we can't actually demonstrate, for example, that God doesn't exist, although in some cases you can, we can demonstrate why there's no good reason to think that they're right. I went to a Church of Christ in San Antonio. I won't, I won't tell the whole story right off the bat, but um, there was a parade of preachers that would get up to speak. Over the, this was a three-day weekend. And they'd said, Matt, will you come down? We're going to have our lectureship. We would like you to participate. And we're going to have a topic that we discuss each day. And then that evening, we'd like you to debate one of our representatives on what was discussed that day. Originally, they wanted four nights, but I'm only so much of a sadist. And, uh, or masochist. No, wait, somebody correct me later. Anyway, um, I agreed. And they were kind of shocked, actually, because I was there every day, 9 o'clock in the morning, and I listened to preachers straight through till 7 p.m., and I took notes. And then at 7 p.m. I would get up and I would debate their representative for about two hours and take questions afterwards. And uh, while I won't go into all the details of everything that happened, it was painful to sit there and listen to preacher after preacher get up, stand up behind the pulpit and say, I don't really understand the science, but let me tell you why it's wrong. Because this is a young earth anti-evolution church that thinks they are pro-science and they are anything but. I talked a little bit earlier about knowing your opponent's positions even better than they do. That's important. You may not get there right off the bat. You may not have the best grounding in logical reasoning or theology or philosophy, but you can get there. And the reason it's important, if you're doing a debate, to know the other side as well or better than they do, is because when, if you have an audience, by the way, always try to get an audience, they're going to look at this and what are they taking away when the debate is over? Are they taking away a collection of facts, really hard information? Did they take good notes? Or are they taking away an impression? And if the impression that they're left with is that this individual presented some ideas, and this individual presented some ideas, and that's it, we made it nowhere. 
But if their impression is that this person over here really seemed to understand and be able to respond to this person's positions, and they rejected them, even though this is kind of what I feel like, what's that do to them? It sends them out to rethink what they've always believed. It sends them out to investigate a little further and a little deeper. I don't know how many people heard I, I did um, a debate with uh, Ray Comfort <laughs> on, uh, on Christian radio in Minneapolis, St. Paul, uh, just a month or so ago. Uh, everybody knows who Ray Comfort is, which will probably piss Cy off because you all know Ray better. But, um, <laughs> and so Ray had agreed to do this debate. The subject was, does God exist? And I showed up. And Ray said he had no interest in demonstrating that God exists to anybody that we atheists uh, actually know God exists, we're just lying about it, and that I'm destined for hell, and that Ray loves me and wants to save me from that. That was his debate for God exists. And the immediate first question that people asked was, wow, what a waste of time. Don't you, don't you just feel like your time was wasted? No! Because I, as an outspoken atheist, was on drive time Christian radio presenting evidence, presenting sound arguments against what these people believe, and their selected representative was a blubbering buffoon who just said, I don't want to debate. That's a win. If you're going to mark up wins, that's a win. Now, Somebody just sent me a message. Oh, it's the American Atheist app, which you should probably have. Probably announcing that I'm in the middle of my talk. <laughs> so the, the, the people who are down on debates often say things like, well, Bill Nye shouldn't have debated Ken Ham because this was a win-win situation for Ken Ham. Because if Ken loses the debate, then he gets to go back to his base and say, look, the evolutionists are winning, I need more money. And if he wins the debate, then he gets to say, look, we're beating the evolutionists, so I need more money. That's the way it's going to be no matter who he debates. Uh, they did raise a bunch of money, and they did manage to kind of save a financially struggling organization. Uh, I think there was a lot of good done in the debate, and I think there was a lot of harm done in the debate, and I don't know which one won out. But outside of presidential debates, that might be the single most live-watched debate in the history of the United States. I know the stream that I was on was closing in on a million people watching it. And if Bill and I manage to reach one person, I'll take it, because I think the Creation Museum is going to go under eventually anyway. They're going to, they're going to, they're going to eventually go bankrupt. Yeah. So this was a win-win uh, for them. But the thing about debates is that they can be really good for building groups and bridging gaps between groups. They reach both the religious, the closeted atheist as well. And it's good for inf information for those of us who want to get better at arguing. A single evening debate can potentially draw more than an entire conference. Seth and Arne and I are on this Unholy Trinity tour, uh, which is a joke, by the way. Because uh, nobody wanted to be like Horsemen's 9, 10, and 11. But uh, so we went to Amarillo. Uh, for the first event, and we had, I, I don't even know what the numbers were, but it was 100, 150, maybe. Um, and part of that was because they were working with Rabbi Zacharias Ministries, and there were some churches that were going to come in, and we'd offered to give them the first three questions, and none of them showed up. So, we win. Uh, <laughs> but, two years earlier, I was in Amarillo for a debate. 650 to 700 people at the last headcount showed up in Amarillo, Texas, to see me debate Abdu Murray on whether or not America should be one nation under God. Debates draw people. And it doesn't just have to be Hitchens, who everybody loves, I'll watch him debate, or Stephen Fry, wow, wasn't that awesome? People are interested in this because there's this open exchange of ideas, and that's who we are. We are social creatures that need to interact. And when we have family members, when we are the closeted atheist that is sidelined at dinner and sits over in the corner for Christmas time and doesn't actually want to say anything because we don't want to piss everybody off and have them look 
Matt ruined Christmas again. <laughs> Those are the people that we need to be helping. Because some of them aren't out yet. And having these sorts of conversations where people can get together. Now personally, if I'm debating, I don't want any of you there. I don't want a single atheist in the room because my goal is to reach as many theists as I can and you guys are taking up seats. <laughs> Watch it online, figure out what you need there. Uh, while I love the applause, uh, I don't need it. I need, to, I need to hammer my ideas into the head of more theists. But they're good for raising money for local groups as well because there's the interest. And these theists that show up at these debates expecting their representative to do incredibly well may be in for a surprise. How many people are at this convention? About 700 or so. Now, I don't pretend that this is about me, that, oh, I went to Amarillo and I drew 650 people all by my little self. And American Atheist got seven, 800 people for a whole year. No, that's absurd. But there was a need for it in Amarillo. There was a joint uh, effort between us and the ministry groups that brought countless religious people in there. I think the audience was roughly split 60-40 their way. But we had an amazing debate. I'm going to tell you what something that happened at the end of that. When I was done, this 13-year-old girl walked up to me afterwards and she said, my family is non-religious, they're non-theists, they probably identify as atheists, and they've been encouraging me to go out and explore various religious ideas, and I, I have, I've taken me to different events. And then I said I wanted to come and listen to this debate, because I don't know what I think. And now I'm an atheist. Now, yeah, good, for her. good for her. I don't care if everybody else left that debate thinking exactly what they thought when they walked in. That one person was enough for me to carry my ass all the way to Amarillo and put up with some just absurd arguments about rights. It was mentioned the other day that arguments aren't evidence, and I agree, and I would love to, to take some time to give like a, a uh, logic 101 where we talk about the construction of a syllogism and how true premises lead to true conclusions, um, because they're right, arguments aren't evidence, but our goal is to be rational, and the purpose of constructing an argument is to demonstrate that if you accept that these premises are true and you don't accept the conclusion that comes from it, you're being irrational. It doesn't matter if the premises are actually true. If you're convinced that they're true and you don't accept the conclusion, you're being irrational. Our goal is to live a rational life, to make as many rational decisions as we can. My, the t-shirt thing, I want to believe as many true things and as few false things as possible. That's about making sure that the internal model of reality in your head maps as accurately as possible to the actual reality you experience. Arguments aren't evidence, but the premises that you put into a syllogism need to be backed by evidence. You need to be convinced that they're true. We can't actually demonstrate the truth of everything, and science doesn't lead you to truth. Science doesn't make any proclamations about truth. Science builds models that best describe the universe doesn't make proclamations about absolute truth. And we live our lives by inference induction, and we are concerned with beliefs. Some people say, why are you so worried about beliefs? It's knowledge that matters. Yes, I would like us to have knowledge, but I'm concerned about beliefs because we don't wait until we have knowledge to act. We act in accordance with our beliefs. And what does it mean to say I believe something? It means I am convinced that this is true or most likely true. What does it mean to be convinced? What does it mean to believe this? It means that you are now convinced, and this is the result of becoming convinced, which is the result of being persuaded that this position is true, which is the result of arguments and evidence. And so to do a dismissal on debate, quite frankly, how else do you plan to reach people? They think they have evidence, and so if your response to believers who are convinced that they have evidence is to say, ah, oh, you don't have evidence. That's me, that's you saying, you can't convince me. Which is fine. 
And if you don't have any interest in engaging debates and reaching out and building the atheist community and, and, and helping people free themselves from religion, it's fine for you to say, I'm not convinced by your evidence I, and I'm not being facetious. It's, that's fine. But if your goal is to change their mind and all you say is, I don't accept your evidence, I don't see that you've made any progress at all. It seems to me that the only mechanism that we have if we cannot actually factually disprove their claim is to demonstrate them how they have shifted the burden of proof, how they have bought into a fallacious argument, how they have wandered down this road where they are believing something because it feels good to them or the people who are surround them and it's been reinforced over and over by these cognitive biases that we have and teaching them about that. And that's a debate. People call into the show in the same way as I do when I'm doing a large public debate, I'm not necessarily trying to change their mind, or at least not right away. I am a huge, huge fan of debating, um, in case you didn't know. <laughs> and if you think I'm wrong, we can do a debate about that. But. <laughs> I like the argumentation. I like being forced to think on my feet, which is why I, you know, you can debate a million different ways. You can debate in a book, you can debate online in YouTube where you submit proposals back and forth. You can do it on a forum, you can do it on the TV show. I like all of them, and I especially like the live ones. And uh, I, I joked with Seth, I don't know if he's in here, but uh, he asked me to do a little video, and I sat down in front of the camera and I was trying to record something, and my brain just wasn't working. And my wife was sitting in the room and I was like, is it really true that I can't think if there's not an audience? And she just looked, looked up at me like, what am I, a child lover? <laughs> yes, you are my favorite audience. I like being in the position where you have to be prepared for almost anything, where, where my goal is to know their position better than they do so that people see that and so that I can get them off script. Because what you will find for almost all of these is that they have a script, half of them have no damn clue what they're talking about, they heard this from William Lane Craig and it sounded good and if his script's good enough for him, by George, I'm going to use it too. And as soon as you say, I don't know, at the Church of Christ in San Antonio, there were several things that just infuriated them. One is that they said words have meaning and I said, no they don't. Words don't have any intrinsic meaning. Words have usages. Dictionaries aren't authority on what words mean. They're, they're, they're descriptive about how we use words and language changes over time, which is why it's absurd that there's, you think there's a God who delivered the most important message that could ever be delivered in languages that die off and change. The second thing that made them mad is Matt just keeps saying, I don't know. We brought this atheist guy down here and we asked him, where consciousness comes from, and he says he doesn't know. We asked him why there's something instead of nothing. Why does everything exist? He said he doesn't know. We asked him about the purpose of life. He said, well, I said a little bit more than I don't know, but boy, did it annoy them that I didn't come down. And the preacher actually came up to me afterwards and said, does it, doesn't it bother you? Are you happy to go to your dying bed saying I don't know? No. That's why we go out and explore. I am not going to be happy not knowing, but that doesn't mean that I'm justified in pretending I do know in order to make me feel better about not knowing. So if you're going to do debates, talk about what you know and be ready to say I don't know when you don't know. And follow it up if you're teaching kids and a kid asks you something, Say, I don't know, but let's go find out. And as long as you're talking to theists, if they're going to act like kids, say the same thing. I don't know, but let's go find out. Because their method for finding out is not the same as the rest of the world. Their method is to say, there's a book for that. <laughs> I got books too. And I don't believe things just because they're in a book, even if it's written by a prominent scientist. It's the evidence behind it and our ability to discover and explore, or explore and then discover, that gets us to a better understanding of reality. If you want to do formal public debates, by all means, watch lots of them. Talk to the people who've done many of them. There are many people in this room uh, who've done tons of debates, so there's lots of people in the movement that you can talk to. Um, I'm not going to give out a list of names um, other than to say, you know, Eddie and Frank and blah, blah, blah. 
talk to them because there are many different approaches, there are many different views, there are many different takes on which arguments work, which ones don't, what format works better than others, what questions or what positions should or shouldn't be debated. Get all those opinions, and if you disagree with them, fine. Because I do, I disagree with everybody in this movement at some point, which, which is fun actually, because that promotes more debates. <laughs> but the point is that people have these beliefs for different reasons, and they're going to give up those beliefs for different reasons, and this is why we need both firebrands and diplomats, this is why we need both public formal debates and informal discussions with your family and TV shows like ours and blogs and YouTube because we need to reach as many people as possible and if we start closing doors on our avenues to reach people we have shot ourselves in the foot. You need it all. I have a great deal of respect for most of the people who are willing to walk into an environment like a formal debate and defend what they believe uh, no matter how much I might despise what they actually believe. I've debated the secular pro-life group or some representative or quasi non-representative blogger of theirs on a couple of occasions and I respect both Christine and uh, Clinton for actually defending their positions in a debate. It's hard to do. This isn't for everybody. There's a personality component to it. There's a theater component to it. There is a rhetorical component to it. Not everybody is geared to do this and not everybody is willing to say I'm ready to put my beliefs up on trial in front of everybody. This is why you do the debates. And I'm not necessarily going to, to, to venture off into territory and, and talk about mirror neurons, but I will talk about empathy and what we know about it. And that is, if I see someone up there defending what I believe, and they put themselves in a position where they are humiliated and embarrassed, I experience that. But I have the good fortune of not being that person, and not, have been, not having been in that position, and so now I'm going to go figure out how to make sure that shit never happens to me. And so when they see their heroes embarrassed, this sends them out to find better defenses. This is how you make atheists. When I was a fundamentalist Christian trying to change the mind of my roommate, my goal was, how do I convince an atheist that they're wrong? So I went and looked. It backfired spectacularly. <laughs> Whether you're doing a formal debate or an informal debate, it doesn't matter. You are going to offend people and you're going to piss them off because they're already offended and pissed off in some cases merely that you exist and that you aren't willing to shut the hell up. So don't worry about it. Do your best to make sure you're addressing ideas and not people. Although it happens on occasion that I might have called somebody a moron at one point or another. <laughs> But don't fall prey to this idea that when they start talking about how offended they are or start demanding respect for their beliefs. Hang on. I'm a preach. If there's any one point that I would love to drill into the head of the theists who I dearly love, especially some in my family, is that when you say respect my beliefs, my immediate response, even if I did happen to respect them, is hell no! I'll respect your right to hold those beliefs, but if you believe the earth is 6,000 years old, that people shouldn't be allowed to love and marry as their hearts dictate, that your underwear is magical, or that the whole of this life is just a place to wipe your feet until you get to go to magical happy land, your beliefs are not deserving of respect and I won't. <laughs> It doesn't, mean, it doesn't mean that I don't respect you as a person, and me telling you that shows you that I respect you as a person. Well, why are you trying to debate me? Because I give a damn. If I thought you were too stupid to figure this out, I wouldn't waste my time. I, why would I want to debate somebody who I thought was too stupid to ever understand what I'm saying? Other than to show the other people who may not be, but... But when we talk about beliefs, it goes further, because if you believe that prayer should be the primary source of medical care for your children, that it's good to hide child rapists in order to protect the reputation of your church, or that it's okay to marry your young daughters off to dirty old men, then your beliefs aren't merely unworthy of respect, they are worthy of contempt, ridicule, and direct, consistent opposition. I do debates for a lot of reasons. I 
Doop, the TV show, Every Call to Debate, uh, the debate we're doing in Memphis on May 31st against that guy that nobody you know. Um, if you don't think that debates work, think again. And the only reason I'm doing this is because this has come up and because this is the topic today. Raise your hand if debates played an important role in you finding your way out of religion. Now put them back down. This is the ego part. Raise your hand if the atheist experience in the debates that I've done contributed to you being an atheist and being here. And I have, and I have thousands of emails that the show receives constantly from people who have found them, their way out of almost everything. If you think debates don't work, think again. When I walked into that Church of Christ, I listened to them and I took notes and then I debated their representative. I honestly answered, I don't know. I showed them that I understood, that I paid attention, that I had some background and had been there to some extent, although the Baptists think the Church of Christ is a cult and the Church of Christ thinks that the Baptists aren't true religion, so they just wrote me off as, well, you followed a false religion, so of course you're a non-believer now. But I also showed them that their Bible is immoral. The Sunday night debate was on morality, and I flatly pointed out how immoral their Bible was. And one of the points that seemed to resonate was that I said, I can write a better moral guide than the Bible right now, and I can prove it to every single one of you, because I can rewrite your Bible word for word, and instead of endorsing slavery, I can prohibit slavery, and it's now a better moral guide. And I can do that for every single thing that that book got wrong, that you know it got wrong, but you deny it. And they spent hours twisting and turning and trying to defend the Bible's position on slavery over and over again. Oh, it was like a criminal system, and we were really helping those criminals by leading them to the one true God. Well, you had to let them go after six years. No, that only applied to Jews. Well, you know, maybe God was just trying to lead us in the direction of, so that we would eventually realize that slavery was wrong and get rid of it. Um, he's God. If he can say, thou shalt not kill, and thou shalt not wear poly cotton blends, he can certainly say, thou shalt not own another human being as property. You have the dumbest excuses for your beliefs. <laughs> Over the course of several terrifying and depressing days in that church where I watched joyous celebration of willful ignorance on parade and encouraging it in other people in the pews, I was pretty depressed. And I had claw marks in my wrist because Beth was sitting next to me and would reach over and go, <laughs> oh, I won't tell everything that happened afterwards. There were some discussions. Some people in the church were not happy that they brought me down. And they went to the elders to talk about it. Hey, and they, some of them had dared to suggest that I might have presented a better case than their representative. And then they started emailing me. I had a gentleman who said, you know, hey, I'm a widower and my church is opposed to sex outside of marriage. What do you think? That's weird. I didn't talk about sex much all weekend, I don't think. These, these are people that only accept the New Testament. That's their only authority. And in the course of three days, I went down and I debated. And now some of them are willing to reach out to another potential authority. And of course, the first thing I'm going to tell them is, stop reaching out to authorities. Go, find yourself a consenting partner and have as much sex as you want. Do it like bunnies. Woo <laughs> Debates get people talking. They get people thinking. They help free people from years of indoctrination. They help build new atheists to fill conferences like this. They help give atheists better arguments to create more atheists who have better arguments to create more atheists. They're one of many tools at our disposal. And in addition to doing the TV show as long as I will and the informal debates, I will continue to do the big, flashy, formal, constructed public debates for as long as I die, even if, as long as I live. That would be good. <laughs> and it completely killed the build-up to my closing. For as long as I live, even if there's ever only one 13-year-old girl that comes up and tells me that she's an atheist because of what we've done. There are plenty of people in this movement who spent years studying all of the problems in theology, not just Christianity. A lot of it, we didn't have to do the legwork. If you want to know what's wrong with Christianity, you ask a Jew. If you want to know what's wrong with Judaism, you ask a Muslim. So we, they did a lot of work for us, but there are a lot of people here who spent their lives learning this stuff and living this stuff and caring about people. 
Debates are kind of critical thinking theater. And you take something different away from it. And when you have, when the debates are done well, and you have a knowledgeable, passionate, empathetic proponent of a position, that can help change the world. And if you don't want to change the world, that's your problem. Don't get in the way of those of us who do. Thank you.